and I'm proud to call her my friend and a mentor, Dr. Barbara Brown Wilson. <clears throat> well, I can completely not live up to that, but thank you anyway. Um, I am very, very happy to have you as my friend and, and mentor as well. Um, thank you for having me here. It is really fun to be back in Texas. I'm a big, big fan of the state, even though I feel far from it at the moment. I'm um, always, always ready to engage with my people. Um, and uh, I wanted to talk a little bit uh, with you today about the sort of bridge between some projects I've been working on uh, for years and some projects that I've just started taking on as, um, as a resident of my local community. Um, so this is the first time I'm talking about some of that stuff. Um, and it, it's not quite research. It's this other thing. So you can, uh, you, you, might, you might need to be patient with me as I, as I get through it. But I, I hope it will be um, useful and, and worthwhile for our conversation. So this graphic was, um, it's, an, it's a group that no longer exists, but right after Katrina, the People's Hurricane Relief Fund and Oversight Coalition was formed, and, um, and they actually used, um, they say it's a South African slogan, and that's not wrong, but it's also a disability rights slogan, and I have long spent my um, uh, time and energy, when I was a student, I was studying social movements and how they impact the built world. And this slogan in particular is a really important one uh, to the disability rights movement as they um, you know, created the Americans with Disabilities Act. Nothing about us without us is for us. Uh, I think it's a very beautiful flyer, so uh, some of you who've heard me speak before, uh, it, it is often shown. Uh, but it is incredibly relevant to what I want to talk about today because I really want to dig into knowledge. I want to talk about um, power and really thinking through how we make decisions, uh, and especially in land use and planning and, and design, um, there's, a, there's a huge gulf, it feels like, between uh, sort of technical expertise and the lived experience of the place. Uh, and so trying to think through how, you know, if we want to take this seriously, that nothing about us without us is, is for us, um, especially when we're dealing uh, with traditionally underserved communities, um, what does this charge mean? What does it look like not only in research but also in practice? Um, so uh, let's see if I can figure out how to make this go forward in a meaningful direction. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to figure it out and then I won't make you awkwardly watch me this whole time. Okay. Um, so agenda, just to recap really quickly, we will first de develop some shared definitions because there's some words that I will use, hopefully none that feel too much like jargon, but um, you may have different definitions, so we're going to get all on the same page. Uh, and then we will go into, um, into the world of community-driven design. Um, this, this book I've been working on, Resilience for All, was published this past May. Uh, and so I'll give you one of the cases um, from practice. What does this look like in, in practice when communities are really driving their own, uh, their own design processes? And then, as I said, I want to talk about some work that's happening in Charlottesville that I am a part of. Um, this is uh, this is work that has um, has been coming for for many years, but it's also in directly in response to the white supremacist attacks um, of August 11th and 12th, 2017. So um, warning, warning there. Um, so first, knowledge. Um, Clearly, we all are invested in knowledge. We, we believe in knowledge or we wouldn't be sitting here in this you know, institution of higher education, either uh, developing and accruing degrees or giving them. Um, you know, we, we believe uh, in, um, in its, you know, the, the sort of value of technical expertise. But if it's not clear already, I'm really trying to get us to think hard about what we um, what we give up when we share uh, the power with, uh, with local expertise and, um, and what we gain. Um, I know this is actually a place that does, that does the, the power sharing really well, so I don't feel like I'm telling you all something incredibly new, but hopefully I'm, I'm giving it a take that is, um, that is something generative for our conversation. Um, and we, we all believe that knowledge is power or, um, or we wouldn't be spending all of, all of this time, but I think more than that, we often equate in planning and design processes um, knowledge with being heard 
Like, so people were, they participated in the process, they attended meetings, they were consulted and informed, right? Like kind of right in the middle of Sherry Arnstein's ladder of citizen participation um, is typically where um, the design and planning community stays, is the, is the sort of informing, uh, consulting version of things. But I want to think about what happens when you go up the ladder. I mean, that article is now 50 years old. It's still relevant um, today in, in many of, um, uh, of, of our practices and in our literature, but I don't think we see often how decision-making power is um, redistributed in ways that actually benefit the project. Um, I think there's a sort of inherent belief that that's risky business. Um, and, uh, and I think we should, we should push ourselves. We should try that on. Like, when is it actually really important to have local knowledge drive the situation? In the disability rights movement, you had the lived experience of uh, addressing barriers and, and really the ability through that movement, because people with disabilities were on the front lines, you see um, the lived experience changing uh, the notion, right, the cultural change necessary came from um, tying those lived experiences with not a medical problem, but actually an environmental limitation, right? So, so it's not only thinking about um, the knowledge of how big does the circle need to be to make sure that the wheelchair can, you know, can turn around, but also what are, you know, what are the environmental limitations uh, to doing this work in a way that is inclusive of, of, a, of a community that we all be a part of in some point in our lives. So we've been doing this for years, right? Like, I, I will acknowledge right now that this is nothing new. Not only do we have 50-year-old wonderful heuristic ladders, but also things, you know, for 25 years ago, talking about adaptive practice is, um, you know, really this understanding that uh, there are certain types of problems that um, he's using in this early case study, the medical uh, patient client, you know, and, and uh, physician metaphor, but then he applies it directly to planning practice. Um, there are certain types of uh, problems where the physician has technical knowledge, you're good. It's, a, it's something to be solved. There's other types of problems where the problem is clearly, a, you know, to be defined, but, but the solution requires some technical and adaptive knowledge. But then, you know, what I'm interested in are these really complex um, wicked problems of um, structural inequity, of um, disparities in, um, in the ways that we uh, react to uh, climate volatility, all of the things that are happening across the globe in patterns, right? Disproportionate patterns to certain types of, of people. Um, I, I really believe, and I know others do here especially, that there is this um, need to think differently about local knowledge and its role that it can play um, in, in understanding not only the problem, as, as it should be defined, but also the solution, which means you need to come to the table earlier and you need to share power, right? Because if we're gonna define the problem together and the solution together, then I have to trust you that your local knowledge means something to me. And I, I don't think that's something we're, we're taught typically in, in practice. Um, again, a decade ago, we see uh, you know, planners pushing this even further. What does co-production really look like? Okay, well, co-production, to be clear in this case, is not only for the design of the services, but also the delivery of the services, right? So you see, again, this sort of nothing without us, um, about us, uh, manifested in our own uh, literature and practice. Um, and so I did, um, as I was writing this book, I did a survey of, and the, I spoke in Dr. Winslow's uh, class earlier, so some of you have seen this already, um, but uh, I promise not to repeat anything else. But I, um, I, I basically, I started, there's a lot of jargon in the social impact design, public interest, uh, creative placemaking world, and I started trying to make um, a bit of a glossary of terms, and then I realized that actually language is very fluid, and that was not a useful thing, uh, because as soon as the book would be out, all the words would be old and not helpful. And so instead, I asked practitioners and researchers to map out, that, that self-defined defined them, you know, themselves somewhere in this continuum, to map out where they thought all these terms were, 
And I didn't, I, I said, you know, rank from one to 10 in terms of product oriented to capacities oriented and in terms of professionally driven to community driven in terms of decision making. And so uh, people, um, you know, had varied, um, varied responses, but of course the patterns, once you get a couple hundred submissions, become clear. And when you overlay this with the literature, we saw three chunks. There was this version that's just accessible, which is basically just um, affordable, right, or free. And so this is still a, a real traditional form of design practice, which is often a, your sort of patron-driven model, where somebody um, who's paying for it says, here's how we're going to ask the question. Here's how we're going to seek out the answers. And then, uh, and then there's also a lot of do-it-yourself stuff over here that's affordable because it's uh, guerrilla. It's, it's do-it-yourself. It's, it's uh, sort of you know, um, tactical and, and, uh, and often very, very, very small. But often people of color are over-policed when they're doing these practices, so that is, it is not actually always useful um, to think of it in, uh, in traditionally underserved communities to, to ask them to go, go extra governmental, extra legal um, in the way that they're going to respond. OK, so moving up the ladder, then we see this pattern that is really the sort of codes of ethics sweet spots for all of our, um, all of our fields, thinking about um, just general, you know, sort of responsible design, resilient design, sustainable design. Uh, but often this is for the larger public. And um, I want to posit that especially in, um, you know, uh, vulnerable communities that are also vulnerable because of low socioeconomic status, as well as typically being in the lowland or the, the place that is more at risk, um, there might need to be a real focus on equitable solutions, right? That not are just about equal access, but actually meeting people where their needs are and disrupting these patterns, redressing inequalities. And so I wanted to know what that looks like, because there's not actually that much research that tells us how this looks in practice, except for people talking about their own work, which just um, is always going to be positive. And there's never going to be as much learning in something that's super, super happy. Um, so that's where the book project came from is really thinking through what are the origins of this work that comes really out of the civil rights movement and is focused on um, this charge that, you know, as Whitney Young says in his sort of famous AIA convention speech in 1968, that, you know, um, you're, you're, you are known, architects are known for their thunderous silence and their complete irrelevance in the cause of civil rights. And so it's at that moment that you see um, the AIA take a, a real serious look at how they're going to be involved. Planning's doing the same thing. Um, and, uh, and so from that, you see um, community design and participatory design, but most of these things stay much in the informing and consultation version of things. So I really wanted to know, okay, so if you're really moving up the ladder to something where there is a focus on um, self-determination and capacity building and a sharing of power, um, what, what does that make, you know, how does the work look different? Um, so, uh, so the book is, um, is, this is my, you know, publisher wants me to add this slide in for you. Uh, and so if you, if you do want to buy it, you, you know, get 20% off, but know that all of the proceeds are going um, to the communities in, um, in which uh, I'm serving, because this is not um, a money-making effort. Um, and uh, Shannon is not here tonight, but she, um, Professor Van Zant is a, um, a colleague and a, a mentor of mine. We, we were talking earlier, and she was a, um, a reviewer. She told me right afterwards that she was a reviewer, and she was the one who said, gosh, I wish you didn't use the word resilience, because it just is like, you know, overused. And, um, and she's not wrong in some senses, but I wanted to engage not only with the resilient planning community, um, but also uh, kind of complicate the word, but also the theories of resilience planning are really, really useful when you're thinking about the ways um, to make adaptive practice really work. Um, and so I won't belabor it too much, but I will say this is a sort of play on um, the work that uh, Gunderson and Holling did on panarchy. But, um, but this notion that there are often these, um, 
these stressors, urban stressors that take communities into a time of sort of creative destruction where things are changing, capital is sort of redispersing, and it's not necessarily um, an incredibly lucrative and productive time um, for a community, but is a time um, of, of power redistribution. So uh, ideally, these loops are very small, and uh, you, know, you, you don't stay stagnant too long, and, and there isn't a sort of accumulation and a standardization and a regulation that, that keeps things too tight. Um, and then you know if your loops are if your loops are small, you're you're adaptive, and the no stage stays too long. Um, so uh, so I did eight case studies for it with with some amount of, um, of of real depth, where I I was able to to stay and interview all of the actors involved, have focus groups, and and really approach them um, uh, from from a sort of traditional case study research uh, lens, and the the other four were mostly just to say like this really does happen across the country all the time, um, and uh, and and you know each in a very unique and place based way. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about um, Denby, Detroit. It uh, mostly because it is um, the least sort of. Uh, Disaster or resilience focused in the traditional sense, and so it might it might be something that's less discussed in a in a in a place that really knows its disaster research very well. Um, Denby is um, uh, the uh, one of the most crime ridden neighborhoods in the country, especially post foreclosure crisis. So Denby was hit really hard. Um, by the foreclosure crisis has a very high vacancy rate. Um, it is 92% uh, African American, which is a pretty um, normal percentage for Detroit. 44% um, low income, which um, is actually on the lower side, but the crime rate's really high because of the vacancy rates. And one of the only anchor institutions in this neighborhood is their high school. It's a historic um, designated high school. It's a beautiful asset. And, uh, and so the city of Detroit declares bankruptcy, and they go through a series of planning processes to try to figure out what is next, um, what, what, they will, what they will do. Uh, the, um, the first effort was actually called the Detroit Works Project, which is not a good name if you're not providing jobs. Um, so <laughs> let's, not, let's not do that again. Uh, and it didn't, it didn't work. People, it was, it was a set of outside entities and it was not well received. There was a lot of anger that wasn't getting processed and um, people were sort of asked to check their trauma at the door, which I know you all know is, um, is not a best practice. Um, and so they had to reset. And so they, they had a sort of 2.0 of planning for the future of Detroit. They didn't want it to be a stagnant plan. They wanted it to be a, a framework, a 50-year sort of vision for the city. And so the um, Detroit um, Collaborative Design Center was asked to lead it. And they said, you don't get it. It can't be one entity. It has to be the city working together. So they actually gathered resident leaders from across the city that you know, represented different sectors of the workforce, but also different neighborhoods in Detroit. And they were all paid for their time uh, through a sort of extra governmental, through the, through the Kresge Foundation, which is also based in Detroit, to do a sort of second attempt at a 50-year vision and, and plan um, for the city. This uh, is called the roaming table. It's like super cool designer thing that folds up. It's now in the Smithsonian. Um, but it was this sort of lovable asset that they would go to where people were. They would go to events and ask a series of questions about what people wanted from their city. And this is really driven by this resident leader, a group that becomes, um, they call themselves the impact table. And they, and they really carry on um, through the, uh, the planning stage and into implementation of what they call Detroit Future City. Um, I, in the book, I make actor networks for all of these groups, partially because I want to prove that actually it happens different every place, and also um, that it's a, it is always a network. It is always a constellation of groups working together. There's always some sort of base building that happens. It's not always by the design team, um, but, uh, but it is never one entity. I feel like sometimes in design schools, we're told, like, be the, be the change you want to see. And like, that is not the way this works. Typically, it is, it is coalitions that are strong because they're working together. Um, so this is the Denby Actor Network. And, um, and what they realized during the Detroit Future City process is 
that when they ask young people, they made this very cool planet tool that was a, you know, an online game basically, and they would have different middle schools compete to, you know, be be the most dynamic um, uh, responders to the survey. But all of the young people, or not all of them, but a, a majority of them, and this was proving out in the statistics and in the, in the demographics, were saying, as soon as I turn 18, I am out of this town. Um, and so they, they became really concerned with the sort of brain drain phenomenon uh, and knew that when they got to the implementation stage, and again, we have this impact table of people from across the city working together, um, and DCDC is, is sort of facilitating this process, but, it, and, but it's really this, this coalition. Um, so they decide to work with the students at Denby High School um, because there's a, a willing teacher and a, a sort of great need for, it's a, it's a high school that's suffering um, in, in a lot of ways. And actually, I should say that this is the, um, this dot is technically the Michigan Environmental Council, but actually um, Sandra Turner Handy becomes the sort of protagonist in this story. She is a long-term Denby resident who's also a community organizer for Michigan Environmental Council who really starts the connection with these high school students and tries to transform their curriculum into something place-based because we all know that there, there's actually a lot of power in that. They, uh, they had this you know, year-long capstone and all the Impact Detroit leadership team uh, start contributing to the, the learning um, through science and math and all of these different ways about, um, about planning, about land use, uh, and, and about Detroit Future City uh, it, with the idea that not only is their learning going to be more interesting and more dynamic, but also that they might want to stay and sort of increase their, their civic will. So crime is a huge issue. They map out vacancy um, rates and actually um, choose, uh, choose crime uh, you know, reduction and also uh, playscape development as their sort of main focus of efforts. They, uh, they survey the residents and realize that although there's a really strong block group world, there's not a sort of larger Denby neighborhood resident organization, and so they help the adults get organized um, into the Denby Neighborhood Alliance. And then, um, and then they work with them first to um, demolish a very dangerous building that's right next to um, the playscape they want to develop and also right next to the bus stop where sometimes people are waiting for hours and it's, it's, it's not um, a very safe uh, area. And then they, they work with the Denby Neighborhood Alliance block groups to map out all the safe routes to school. Um, then, uh, they start to plan what they want for this play field. It's called the Skinner Playfield. It is directly next to the high school um, and, uh, and an abandoned municipal playfield. So there's not a lot of green space. It's a huge underutilized asset. And the students want, want it to, to be better for them. So they use really, really accessible um, technologies. And it's mostly like collage making and really, really basic things. Uh, originally to, to make them know that there, there's not a, a barrier, that, that their knowledge is actually really valuable. Um, and, uh, and they start to develop designs for um, Skinner Playfield, and they end up here. And one of my favorite stories about local knowledge is actually the placement of these basketball courts, because Charles Cross is the landscape architect with DCDC, really working on the specifics here. And um, the basketball courts keep coming to the corner you know, because it's an efficient use of the corner, right? As, a, as good designers, we're like, boop, we're gonna move it back. Um, and they kept moving, the, the teens kept moving it back. And finally, he's like, all right, let's talk about this. Like, this is driving me crazy. You know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm willing to negotiate on this point. And this is actually the, um, the fence of the high school, so there is no road right here, but all of the other areas are surrounded by road. And this is a um, gang-neutral area, this park, but they said no one is going to play. Like, we desperately need these basketball courts, but no one's going to play if they're right on the edge because it will, be, it will feel um, at risk. It will feel like a potentially dangerous environment. Um, they end up doing a lot of other really amazing uh, amazing, you know, pieces of this uh, of this design project. But what I find most worthy um, of of noting is is actually what what they do to make this happen. So they do a blitz build. They get ten thousand volunteers. They work with a number of groups to get ten thousand volunteers to come in one week, and they actually board up on those routes to school that they map. They board up 362 vacant houses. They remove debris from 303 blocks so that the you know, students feel safe to, to get to school. 80 students' homes are repaired. And then they, um, and they like put these little you know, adorable sort of 
feet along the pathways, and then 125 of these planter boxes are planted at every single corner. And this is Sandra Turner Handy's baby, so she goes and waters them every single week, still today, many years later. Um, but within moments, that basketball court, I was there like the they, you know, the sod wasn't even fully in the ground yet, and those basketball courts were getting used every moment of the day. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it is not a perfect process. The, uh, the school systems in Detroit are riddled with their own issues. Um, but as soon as, um, as soon as it was implemented, the project actually, uh, the graduation rates from one year to the next, the, you know, the, the sort of year of this capstone went from 44% to 70%, um, and the crime went way down. Um, so I am not, I am not, it is coral, you know, uh, not causal at, at this point, but it's, uh, but there was something really positive that happened. And this is just, you know, in Detroit Future City, there's this notion that the school is a hub and a community asset that does many, many things, um, and that the use of it should be all day long and really driven by people, and that community policing should be a major part of, um, of reducing crime, not necessarily a sort of top-down policing model. Um, and so they, they make that manifest here in this project, and it, and it turns out to be incredibly impactful. There is Sandra and Charles, my, my sort of two uh, protagonists in, in this story, uh, at the um, groundbreaking, or the sort of opening event this pavilion was a huge part of the design process that was really important. It has some really cool rainwater catchment features in the middle there, um, but it was also donated by a Denby graduate who heard about the project and got very excited. And, and so the entire project was really funded um, through these uh, neat sources. Um, I want to transition on to some Charlottesville work, but these are the four actor networks of, of the main projects, just to, to show you the point that there are sometimes, um, earlier uh, in, in Jane's class, I actually spoke about um, the Biloxi case up, up in your top left, which is really driven by the Gulf Coast Community Design Studio. Um, but you know, in your top right here, you see that students become the driving force, the sort of catalyzing force. And so there, there are different ranges within this continuum of practice, um, but uh, the ones that are that are sort of centering residents seem to be incredibly meaningful, but they do require a fair amount of organizing um, in in the work. Um, and I can get into the lessons of the book more if you um, if you want. But I think uh, the the only thing that I haven't talked about explicitly is um, valuing, like actually paying all of the participants, is a critical piece to this puzzle. Um, there were projects where people were asked to come and volunteer, um, like in the Lower Manhattan um, uh, Waterfront project. There were a bunch of, um, you know, sort of lovers of design build practitioners that were getting paid for their time, and they were like, on Saturday, we can get the community to come and build everything. But most people were like, I, you know, I do construction all week long. Like, no thank you. I don't want to come and do your volunteer activity um, on the weekend. So, so we've really tried in the projects that I'm going to talk about here to not only think about restructuring power, but also like actual payment. Like, make sure that your budget of your project reflects the values. So if you really believe that um, power should be redistributed, then you have to, you have to value things um, really differently. And we can get into the weeds of how to do that if you, uh, if you want. Ah, I hate this. OK, we're going to figure it out, though. There we go. Eh, too far. So what does this look like for me in Charlottesville? For the past few years, um, it's looked like, um, as uh, Dr. Roberts mentioned, a, uh, a sort of community-driven redevelopment project. I was asked to come on mostly as a board member, but to help them figure out what community-driven housing redevelopment might look like. Um, and, uh, and we realized, so Friendship Court is a 12-acre site in downtown Charlottesville, um, extremely low-income uh, households, 150 place-based Section 8 um, uh, funded households. And uh, there was a fair amount of green space that was a, a sort of channelized creek bed, but they thought uh, they could actually build the first phase of development um, in, on the green space so that nobody had to be displaced for any period of time. 
Um, Charlottesville is a town that has been riddled with um, the traumas of urban renewal, and this was just like not a thing that anyone could abide by. Um, but the housing um, was was really, uh, you know, go, going to go up for um, for renewal and, and resale. And many residents said that this is actually a thing they wanted, but there were no governance structures in place. So my job was to help them figure out how to have a voice um, when actually most of them are very busy. Um, and there was 250 children um, plus, really living on the site. And so I knew that the youth needed um, a voice in the process and that they wouldn't know anything about land use. So we ended up getting a grant through the university, but it was completely passed through um, to pay these youth to become a part of the design team. So we, we first taught them all about land use. They would have mock city council meetings where they kind of understood how decisions get made, where the power is, why does stormwater matter to them, what is food justice about, and why should they be concerned about it. Um, and then uh, Liz Ogbu is a colleague of mine who's been helping with a human-centered sort of redevelopment process, and she and I um, co-taught a class where uh, we really used a human-centered design process for them to figure out which part of the existing place they wanted to prototype change in right away. Um, and they decided the courtyards. So we ended up doing um, surveying. Here you see them administering the survey that the youth created um, to decide you know, collectively what mattered in terms of the courtyards. Um, and then they've done implementation work. They're still kind of uh, going through the stages of, of implementing that design. Um, but, but they really are fully uh, capable now of talking about land use, so much so that two of them were then later uh, seen as legitimate enough experts to be invited on to the governing board, the, the resident advisory board. So that was a, a huge success. Um, the resident advisory board has now developed um, three of the four phases of the plan. The first uh, phase is going through uh, planning review right now and um, will apply for tax credits in March. Um, and what we did on the uh, research side is we actually uh, gathered a fair amount of, of knowledge um, makers that care about creative metrics and looked at all the building assessment systems to realize that actually none of them were really grappling with the inequities and the sort of social impacts of housing redevelopment. And so we created a, a social impact study template that could try to be a point of intervention in that system so that we're switching from a metric of thinking about housing redevelopment in terms of units of affordable housing, which typically results in about 30% of people being rehoused um, in their development into, into households and, and you know, families and really, really thinking about wealth redistribution um, and making sure that the, that the work happens in a sort of community benefit agreement model of practice, which is, which is still uh, new. And when people think of, so this is all pre-August 11th and 12th, and when people think of Charlottesville, for the most part, you think World Heritage Site, uh, a, a founder of the um, you know, uh, United States, but also um, a slave owner and you know, complicated um, you know, person in the world. Uh, when I was moving to Charlottesville, uh, half of my colleagues from UT actually sent me this Guardian article saying it was the happiest place on earth. You know, congratulations, you're going to be next to this Shenandoah National Park. But you all know where I'm getting to. Now when you think about Charlottesville, you think about the white supremacist terrorist attacks. Um, and the people that died, uh, three of my students were hit by that car. And so it became really involved for me as an educator to think through how we grapple with this one very violent moment in time, but also an awareness that actually Charlottesville is a place of in tremendous inequity. Um, the precursor to the opportunity, um, you know, uh, Atlas is, um, is the Chetty tool that's on the interactive on the New York Times website that basically says that Charlottesville is one of the worst places to grow up if you're poor. It has one of the lowest social mobility rates in the country. Um, there was a New York Times expose out this fall that you might have seen actually talking about the achievement gaps between white and black students in Charlottesville. They call it the Yale and jail system of education. Um, and so these were things we were already trying to grapple with through the youth program and elsewhere. Um, but uh, but the stats, you know, uh, along especially racial um, lines are really, um, are really uh, quite jarring. The, you have um, 
the, the white black disparity in infant mortality rates is between um, five times to 11 times higher um, for black families than, um, than white. I, I can go on. Um, the the uh, inequities are huge um, and persistent and, um, and un, unavoidable, unignorable as an anchor institution. And so for UVA, we were getting a new president at the time um, that we were trying to help our uh, selves and our students and our community heal from the sort of jarring uh, part of this attack. But um, as an anchor institute, as the largest employer in the region, we also were like, what do we do? You know, because we have all of these responsibilities as a public um, institution of higher education, but we also clearly need to do better. Um, you know, and checking our own house and figuring out how to redress some of the inequities that we must have perpetuated as the major employer in the region, as the major anchor institution. Um, and so we ended up looking at models where power was shared in the research process. You know, we are also a research one institution. And um, when I moved to Charlottesville, there were many public housing advocates that were telling me all the time, actually the closest public housing um, to the university, there's often as many as 28 different research projects happening to those residents, right? And if you're like a single mom of two children trying to make ends meet on a really fixed income, you do not need 28 separate research projects knocking at your door, right? It's a violence. It's, it's actually harming you. Um, and so they wanted power, not only over um, deciding who gets to come into their community um, to knock on their door and extract knowledge from them, but also what does the data look like? Who gets to analyze the data? Who gets to hold on to that data in the end? So we've been working not only with the UVA libraries to make sure that the data is um, consistent and accessible after the fact to all parties involved in anything co-created, because that's often, right, you know, you do something that's community driven, it's exhausting, you're done, and maybe you post it on a website, but when that website changes, the data's, the data's gone for most people. So really thinking not only ethically about the data and where it lives, but also about the process. And so we looked at, at tribal governance models um, where they have set it up their own sort of thing analogous to an IRB that is community driven. Um, and they've actually piloted a version um, through public housing uh, with our support to figure out, you know, what is, what is the process that you would like to have uh, in terms of like sharing power in, um, in, the, in the research processes that affect you. Uh, we also want to make sure that knowledge gets disseminated, not only reports, um, but that uh, processes are transparent and that um, you know, uh, we, we do not have a lot of policy analysis capacity on staff in the city of Charlottesville and in the region. Um, and so in the very way that PolicyLink has done equity atlases for all the major cities in the country, uh, we were working with the UVA libraries. We got a, a two-year planning grant to co-create an equity atlas there. Um, but we want to make sure that it's done in a way that is decolonizing, right? Because things that are mapped are often um, recreating patterns of, of inequity, even when you have all the best intentions. Um, and so we're not only looking at all of the ways that citizen science can play in, and, and Public Lab has a great set of tools if you, um, if you haven't looked at them before, but also thinking about mapping what is hidden, mapping what is the unmapped thing. Um, and so in this case, I have a graphic because this is a project that's really just begun from Rebecca Solnit's atlases that I think are incredibly gorgeous. But in, in our version, we would like to not only take things, this case is um, famous lies told in the city of New Orleans and also um, where lead poisoning uh, is, is the, you know, the sort of most prevalent um, but uh, we want to make maps with the uh, descendant community, which is really um, a strong and, you know, uh, an important voice, force in Charlottesville um, and an important voice. So we want to make sure that we're co-creating uh, these maps in ways that, that privilege the voice of non-university researchers in the, in the process. Um, and, uh, and also, I've been appointed to this president's working group because he wants to really make sure as he begins his year, you know, his years here, and we actually celebrated the 200th, you know, birthday of the university just the other day, um, that, that he is uh, helping uh, as an anchor institution, his, his sort of tagline of this launch is that a great university cannot be great without also being good. 
And so what does that look like? As an anchor institution, what does good mean for Charlottesville? So we, this survey is still happening and no one has seen these results but you, but um, it's looking like uh, community members really want a living wage and they really want the university com to commit to it um, in a profound way that is not only for our own employees but also all of our contract employees. That's gonna require legislative change. Uh, there is no public university that has yet done that successfully, um, but our, um, our president of the university is a, is a lawyer who, um, who actually was at Harvard while they implemented a living wage there. Um, so we're trying to think about where, um, how we teach all of these things, but how do we invest in them? How do we model that through our practices as a university um, as well? Uh, and, then, um, and then we're also in the final stages of building what would be um, an equity institute that would not only hold the university accountable for the enforcement of these practices in a, in a positive way, but also, um, you know, uh, be the institute that, that helps the community IRB stay active and connected with the traditional IRB resources and also the student groups that, um, that are often, student self-governance is a very big deal at UVA, so making sure that everybody um, has the same and honors the same processes as, as they're doing their work. Um, and then the city of Charlottesville, uh, residents there have, have actually identified the topics that they want to see and invest time in co-creating uh, research. So really trying to change um, the institution in ways that allow for um, anyone who's interested in doing community-driven research to do so um, with a sort of mutual beneficial uh, platform at the heart. Um, so yeah, I'm ready to talk with you all. Thanks, thanks for letting me say my piece.